Good afternoon, good evening, good morning for those of you uh, who maybe are joining us from the West Coast. My name is Brandon Collins. I'm incredibly excited to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you all about growing your your brands uh, from local to global. If you could please take a moment in the chat, uh, post where you're joining me from. Uh, you could put your name, location. Uh, I just really appreciate seeing where everyone's coming from. Take a few moments to do that. All right, we got Freeport, New York, Washington, D.C., welcome, London, Richmond, okay. I'll play a little music while people are filling it out. Okay, we got Cincinnati, Toronto, Oakland, great. Toronto, Utah, that's fantastic. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I always like to start off any events with a little bit of music, just because that helps to set the mood, especially if you're hosting virtual events, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So welcome everyone. Uh, Amsterdam, love that place. Uh, I hope to go back soon when everything clears up. Welcome everybody. Uh, really excited to talk to you all about globing, uh, growing your community local to global. So uh, I am the owner of Casa de Collins uh, LLC, which is a newly founded production company where I focus on uh, elevating unique voices that have a different perspective. And that's uh, that ranges from gender, race, uh, you know, various backgrounds. I, I just try to make sure that everything I produce allows uh, people to learn something as well as have a different type of uh, uh, perspective that they can grow to appreciate. Oftentimes that's through comedy outlets, which I'll talk to you all about. But uh, this was founded uh, last Jan uh, last July, sorry, 2020 during the, the beginning of uh, half of the pandemic. And I decided that I need to put all of my projects under one umbrella just to uh, avoid any confusion and also helps me in regards to like my mailing list and ways that I communicate uh, events that I have coming up in my brand. So again, welcome everyone from your various locations. It's incredible to see all these people around the world uh, joining for today. If you do have any questions for me, please, please feel free to put them in the Q&A slot on your, uh, your reconvene window. So you can, uh, I can answer those at a later time in this presentation. So the purpose of today is to talk, talk about best practices for serving a global audience. So in order for your brand, event space, company to thrive in a post-COVID world, you're going to really need to focus in on your community and allow that community to help groundswell the, um, you know, the anticipation, the awareness about the things that you have going on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I did that with Casa de Collins over the past year. So uh, just to get started on my production journey, I actually started producing events when I was in high school. Uh, in 2004 was my senior year. I'm originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I currently live in Queens, New York. And uh, I was part of a sketch comedy group at the local high school. The group went in a different direction that uh, myself and a few of the founding members weren't so appreciative of. And so what we ended up doing was uh, breaking off and doing our own independent show. And I pretty much spearheaded directing and producing, putting it all together. When I was just 17 years old, I even came up with a budget. We rented out an independent theater. So that's where I got my bones really putting together events. And uh, after I graduated high school, I came to New York, went to St. John's University, where I, I got my degrees in education and school counseling. But I was still producing a lot of comedy events. I uh, was in the stand-up comedy world. I did videos for MTV, College Humor, VH1. So I was able to expand my network. And that's when I started producing stand-up comedy events, as well as uh, various uh, sketch comedy shows throughout the city. And at, up to this point, I've produced over 200 events. And some of those have been private events. Uh, I produced two private events for Yelp NYC, who uh, had this event on a booze cruise. Uh, that was twice I did that. Yes, Yelp rents out a boat. And they take people that are like their elite Yelpers and they all get really drunk. And like we were able to provide the comedy for that event. It wasn't as disastrous as it sounds. It was actually pretty cool. They had like a silent disco, but um, that's definitely been one of the, the crazier events that I've had the pleasure of producing events at. Uh, I've also produced events for pro uh, brown paper tickets, as well as some private uh, local unions in New York City. My events have been featured in New York Times, Time Out New York, Vulture. Um, and several other publications uh, that are uh, throughout the country. 
So um, before I established my LLC, I, like I mentioned, I produced several independent events, both in NYC as well as New Jersey, um, due, just due to location. Um, and then I transitioned to virtual events uh, starting in June 2020. Now, uh, before that, I worked on a lot of uh, local events. I've been, uh, you know, connecting with uh, local business owners since I, I first came to New York in 2008. So I had a lot of connections within the city, within the other outer boroughs, such as Brooklyn, Queens, Harlem. And so I was really focused on growing that that local network. So if I took any of my shows to a different borough, there would be an audience following that. So that was really important for me just to be able to have events that showcase local talent. And so, uh, you know, for instance, I had a long running uh, show called Comedy Outliers that's actually going to be starting back up um, in, in August of this year. But Comedy Outliers was a show that started off in the basement of an Irish pub in downtown Manhattan and eventually expanded to where we were selling out 300 plus C, um, space in Brooklyn. And our audience kept following us at various locations because, as you all may know, uh, bars, uh, that's a finicky business. And so some of the bars that we had started off with, they were closing. So we had to bounce from venue to venue. And because of our communication and the, the groundswell we had with our uh, community, we were able to take that audience to various venues, which ultimately ended up with the Bell House in Brooklyn, where we had a packed 300 plus crowd for our last show. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A slot so I can address them. All right. So um, with COVID, as everyone uh, I'm sure experienced, it was uh, it took a lot of adjustment. It um, it made me reflect on how I can make sure that the message of my my events is very very clear and deliberate because that allows me to focus my marketing. Right. Uh, it forced me to pivot from in person events to virtual events. I um, the last live event I've had uh, before COVID hit was uh, Drunk Black History, which is a quarterly uh, seasonal show that I host that essentially highlights um, the impact of Black historical figures or events that haven't gotten their due. And we also just happen to book uh, radio personalities and comedians who get drunk and they talk, they do a retelling of those specific stories. And so the last event uh, I had live in New York was in February 2020 for celebrating Black History Month at Drunk Black History, had over 150 people at uh, this venue in the Lower East Side. And then, you know, we're planning, we were planning our Juneteenth show. We we're like, oh man, it's going to be even bigger. We got to look at like, you know, bigger venues because clearly there's an audience for this. And then COVID hit. And it, 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 was, it was a bit of an adjustment in regards to just like absorbing that and then trying to determine, are people looking for this event still? Or do they need this? And it turns out they did. And I'll get to the reasoning of how uh, I, I eventually got over hump and resistance of hosting virtual events. Because up to that point, I only hosted one virtual event. And that's from my Medium Popcorn Movie Review Podcast. We hosted one Zoom movie night where we literally showed um, uh, a video. Um, we showed a movie uh, through screen sharing on Zoom. And, you know, our audience, our fans, they were interacting in the chat. And it was pretty well received. But... I was just like, man, this is a lot of work. I like, I know how to use Zoom, but this is so, it's, it's outside my comfort zone and I'm very much a control freak. And so things that are a little bit outside of my control make me really, really nervous. But the more I learned about Zoom functionality, the more I was able to control the environment and make sure that it was as positive of an entertaining space for my audience as possible. Um, and so with that, uh, that transition to online events, I had to really pivot my marketing and I'm gonna talk about the different ways that I did so. And that became a really useful tool for me. And it's paying dividends now, uh, now that I'm, some locations are back on site, as well as providing a hybrid of uh, both like live streaming and in-person shows. So uh, that's been really great. And I'm able to use all the new information that I have to be able to do that. And with the expansion to virtual events, uh, my audience has then expanded. Drunk Black History went from being just a local New York show where people were driving uh, from Philly and Boston and other states to now it's it's global. It's it's worldwide. People at our most recent shows were joining from Australia, Hawaii, London, um, Europe. It was amazing. All right. So... Um, 
I, I do want to answer a few questions from the chat real quick. Uh, Monique is asking, how long did it take for you to grow your audience to 300? That's a great question. It took several, several years. Um, like I mentioned, Comedy Outliers was a show that ran. And this is actually this picture is the picture from our, our final show at the Bell House. We were singing I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys. Uh, we were having a, a fun time. And um, it took seven years for us to get to the place where we were very confident we could sell a 300 plus event space. It, and it, like I said, it slowly grew. Our first year, we built up to our one year anniversary where we had over a hundred people. And at that show, and this is why kind of our show became like a linchpin within the New York comedy community. At that one year show, we had Michael Che, Pete Davidson, who you all may know are from uh, Saturday Night Live now, um, and additional other comedians that have had Comedy Central specials and Netflix specials since then. And so that that showed that we had an audience that was like really following everything we did that were very consistent. And then we ended up pivoting to another venue because that venue unfortunately closed where then we start uh, charging for tickets. And once we saw like kind of how that worked and that the audience would still stick around, even though we were charging a cover, it, it just started building from there. And then it allowed us to like be a little bit more creative with our marketing because we needed to make sure that it was appealing enough for people to want to put down five, $15 uh, for, for our show. And so it took time. It took time to build trust. It took time to build that network, not just for our audience, but also within the comedy, uh, the comedy world, because we were able to get really heavy hitters towards the later half of our shows. Like we were able to get folks from The Daily Show like Roy Wood Jr. and Ronnie Chang, as well as Dan Soder, who's on the Showtime show Billions. Like we were able to get all these great uh, comedians to perform on our shows. And so that allowed Comedy Outliers to get to the next level where we were able to sell out venues like The Bell House. Great question, Monique. Thank you. So uh, kind of going back to the, the origin story, as I mentioned, I've been producing events uh, since I was in high school and a little over a decade now since I've been in New York City. Um, I will admit I grew a little bit complacent with uh, the venues I was working with. I started working with a lot of the same places uh, and my events started kind of feeling a bit redundant. It didn't feel like there was anything unique or special about them. Drunk Black History was the most exciting one. And but that that show requires a lot of work, a lot of prep. And so to be honest, like the the switch to virtual events is probably the best thing for me as a producer because it allowed me to shake things up. I ended up, you know, uh, wrapping up some projects that I wasn't as excited about. Um, and those projects range from uh, shows to podcasts that are under Casa de Collins. So it really allowed me to be a little bit more deliberate of where I allocated my time and resources. And then uh, with the virtual events, I did start making a profit after nearly 18 years of producing uh, events. And I've just been putting that back into the production business. But it's been incredibly exciting to, to get to this uh, point. All right. So producing uh, events during COVID. So, again, uh, beginning of COVID was a bit of a challenging time for me, primarily because I was laid off of my day job at the time. Um, and full disclosure, I had never been laid off a job except for this clo baby clothing store that I worked at when I was in college, but that's because I had four other jobs and it was just like, Hey, I don't, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this anymore. And they were like, yeah, you're, you're right. We don't, you don't have to do this anymore. We're letting you go. And here you now can go collect unemployment benefits, which was really weird for me. Um, but anyways, I digress. So I was, uh, let go. Um, at my day job. And that took some adjustment because it just, I really loved my, my job. Um, I understood that the economy was just not where it needed to be. And so it took me uh, some adjustments to just get over that, um, deal with, uh, you know, the trauma of, of COVID. I'm a very outgoing person. I, as I mentioned, I, I love doing events. So n not even knowing what the future may hold and what's going on, it took me a while to get my bearings. And so I took about a two minute, a two month break, sorry, uh, from, you know, even thinking about events and, and comedy. And uh, I was still producing my, my movie review podcast, but that, that was the only like kind of reprieve from the stress and anxiety I had uh, after being laid off in the beginning of COVID. So um, as I mentioned, my first virtual event was for Medium Popcorn. It was a Zoom movie night. Uh, it was actually early March, 2020. And it went well, uh, you know, it was well received. But again, I thought, man, this is a lot of work. Like, it, it's a lot of work for me as a producer and also the host and the person that has all the Zoom, um, you know, expertise in the, in the group. So maybe we'll revisit this. 
Uh, but then because of COVID, we've since uh, hosted over 12 virtual events for the podcast since March. Uh, our most recent one was actually last weekend where we had a Zoom movie night. We watched and reviewed Joanna Man, which if you haven't seen that movie, good for you. That That's a rough one. Um, <laughs> and for Drunk Black History, the first uh, virtual show we produced was the Juneteenth edition, which was technically my first post-COVID uh, event. And the reason why Drunk Black History happened was because, because of the tra tragedy of George Lloyd last year and just kind of the unrest that we felt in this country. My wife, you know, she sat me down. She said, you know, I know you really are wishing that you can go back on site for Drunk Black History. I know you love the energy of the live crowd, but you know how to host a Zoom event. I think you really should produce a Juneteenth show for Drunk Black History and just see, just see how it goes. And you know what? She was right because that allowed the brand to blow up. And so I am always grateful for my wife for pushing me to get outside my comfort zone and do that. Because I realized when you have a virtual show, you can book talent from anywhere you want. And so we were able to book talent that wouldn't be available in New York City or New Jersey, which was incredible because we were able to have Rod and Karen Moreau, who host the Black Eye Tips, an incredibly popular podcast on the show. We were able to have Ray Sani, who was a writer on NBC's The Good Place, who lives in California. It, it was incredible being able to have those different um, talented people join Drunk Black History from a virtual setting because it expanded our audience, right? And so that was incredible for us. Now, I want to make sure I get to a question that I saw in the chat. Um, Jacob Freeland asks, how did you get that very first bit of money to book venues and get supplies for your first shows, especially if shows didn't become profitable for so long? Yep, that's uh, that's a great uh, question, Jacob. So I'm a workaholic. I've had several jobs at a time since I was in high school. And so for me, it was just about saving and you know personally investing in paying the talent, paying for materials for the shows. For Comedy Outliers, we were free for over a year. Right, but we still had to have the microphones. We still need to have speakers. We were printing out every month these little slips, which is actually a great marketing tool for you all, especially if you're considering going back to on-site uh, events. So I would print out a little slip that had, uh, you know, a blank space for a name, email, and I would use those slips, put them in a bucket at the end of the show, and pull three out. And we gave out really fun, goofy raffle prizes, but it was an incentive for people to fill those slips out. And then it helped us build our mailing list outside of the ticket sale uh, list that we would get. So if you're looking for a creative way to get people to, you know, sign up for your mailing list, that's that's a way I would suggest. Uh, we found that was really helpful. And um, that's what built up our audience to where I felt comfortable personally investing in the events because I knew the potential of how they could grow. So uh, thank you for that question, Jacob. Really appreciate it. All right. So since uh, June 2020, we have produced three virtual events for Drunk Black History. You can find them on uh, our YouTube page. If you just go to YouTube and type in Drunk Black History, they should pop up. Uh, they're a lot of fun. We we had an October show that was like a Halloween horror theme uh, episode. And, you know, a lot of Black History is already kind of like horrific, but we were able to find like some really unique ways to make it engaging, uh, educational, but also fun. And so uh, that allowed us to have the momentum to then produce our February event uh, this year, uh, which was attended by over 200 people in a Zoom room, which was incredible. And like I said, it was people from all over the world. And that was incredibly rewarding and um, just validating of the work that I've been putting in over the past few months uh, with my co-hosts and also uh, with you know my wife support as well. Again, if you all have any questions, please, please post them in the q and I'll be answering them throughout uh, the, the presentation or at the end when I've uh, set aside some time for that. Okay. Uh, this is a picture of our first uh, – uh, well, actually, this is our October uh, Zoom show because I have a top hat. That was my costume for it because – uh, for <laughs> for media and popcorn, I already wore like a costume uh, for that Zoom movie party. I was Mr. Incredible. And so I sweated profusely throughout that night. And I was like, I'm not doing that for Drug Black History. I'm also going to be drinking. So let me just put on a top hat. I was still sweating, but, you know, that was not, that was my way of pivoting there. 
And then uh, that's uh, my co-host, Gordon Baker Bone, who's a hilarious comic who lives in Newark, New Jersey. The reason why I mentioned Newark, New Jersey is because if you know Gordon, he'll always let you know that he's from Newark, New Jersey. All right. So marketing during COVID. So typically what I would do when I was marketing a local New York event was I would post on websites like the New York Daily News, New York One. I would send press releases out to New York Times, Time Out New York. I kept it very, very local, right? And I would do some local podcasts. I would do any podcast that a New York comedian or radio personality would have me on. And I promote comedy outliers, drunk black history, my various podcasts. Um, and that's that's kind of how I spread the word outside of uh, just general word of mouth and the, the, the groundswell of the community that I mentioned, right? But with the transition to you know remote events, I was like, oh, okay, I can go on several different podcasts in different areas, different markets, and I can promote my shows because there now is a platform where people from all around the world can now join. So I'm incredibly grateful to Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood, Decoding 40, and again, the Black IU Tips for letting me have a spot on their platform to promote my various shows, my various projects, because that helped increase the, the visibility of my brand as well as get attention to upcoming events I had. So that helped me exponentially in regards to growing my fan base for the various events I have. And what I like about the, the things that Casa de Accounts is producing is there's there's something for everyone there. You know, you have media popcorn. So if you love movies, that's the jam. It's a little weird sometimes. We go down some weird rabbit holes, but it's an incredibly entertaining show that's been featured in RogerEbert.com. We are official Rotten Tomato critics. So if you look at the tomato meter, you might see our reviews here and there. Um, it's It's been incredible. And so with that, uh, as well as Drunk Black History, which has its own appeal and there's a huge, huge audience for that show. Um, actually, we've been getting a lot of requests to bring that on the road. Um, which we're planning on doing probably in 2022 when things are a little bit clearer in regards to travel guidelines and things of that nature. But uh, in addition to expanding the the podcast network and radio network that I use to promote my shows, I also had to invest more money in marketing. I was used to posting a lot of free ads um, and that's, that's easy for me. I have a spreadsheet with over 50 uh, local publications that I use that were free for me in New York City. But then I realized if I need to expand my reach, I'm going to have to invest. So I pay money for Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. I also uh, reached out to a few other marketing uh, tools to help, you know, expand the, the range of people and eyeballs that could, you know, find out about my events. And th that that hurt a little bit because it was a cost that I'm, I wasn't used to budgeting for. But I knew that it was necessary. Necess uh, necessary in order for me to get the global appeal that I wanted for my events. So um, I want to shout out Eventbrite, uh, who obviously are having me on for this event, but Eventbrite helped me, again, kind of take advantage of uh, opportunities that I wasn't even directly seeking. So they asked me to, to come on their Instagram platform and talk about Drunk Black History in this past February. And I was incredibly grateful for that. And that also, again, those opportunities helped me expand um, awareness about my brands. I just want to shout out, I don't do clubs, which is primarily focused on uh, Black-focused uh, events. And they have been a huge, huge supporter of Drunk Black History. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for them. I've also, uh, with the virtual events, I've been able to expand um, my outreach to sponsors. So uh, before in, in New York City, we were having some local sponsors for Drunk Black History. But with the virtual events, I was able to get um, a more uh, wide variety of different sponsors for our events. And that helped uh, offset some costs for talent um, for my Zoom Pro account because I had to upgrade my Zoom account to be able to accommodate more than 200 something people. So that took some adjustment, but uh, I was more than willing to to like fight for that, to really um, push and encourage these brands to support the shows that I had going on. And also it doesn't hurt that you can point to your mailing list and the various outlets that the show with the, you know, the sponsor branding will be put on. They're really, really going to be interested in that. So um, the demand for sponsorship, uh, once I switched to virtual events, uh, increased exponentially. And then another tool that I did to, to help me really, uh, cater my marketing accordingly was I surveyed and rewarded audience members who filled out a survey to let me know where they were joining from, what about my events appealed to them. And that really just helped me 
focus my my marketing and i am incredibly grateful for that uh i would suggest if you have a brand a company uh, i would suggest you survey your fan base as well just to kind of get an idea of what they're interested in especially in this weird time um what might they feel comfortable doing are they going to be comfortable coming on cypher events are would they prefer virtual would they prefer the option for either one you want to make sure you understand where your audience is coming from and what their needs are before you just kind of figure out you kind of determine this is the course of action uh, in a post-COVID world because it may not quite fit with the demographics of whatever you're producing. For me, uh, medium popcorn, I realized that has to remain a virtual event. After surveying our audience for that podcast, we realized very small audience actually in New York City. Most of our audience is actually down south or in the Midwest. And so that means you know we have to do virtual events until we end up doing live shows in those various markets. So it's just uh, another example of ways that we use our data to determine um, next steps. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A section of the chat. So uh, my tips uh, before we get to the full uh, Q&A, please stay organized. I can't say that enough. You want to use technology such as Google Calendar. I use Google Keep a lot to keep track of my tasks. Um, you want to make sure that you're just staying organized. I have a whiteboard behind me that I also write all my projects on, and that keeps me accountable as well because it's always in my face every day. So I, I can't avoid it. Even though I have my day job, I know, hey, when I'm done, when I, my nine to six, these are some things I have to focus on today. You want to make sure that you're very uh, detailed with your uh, outlining your your action plan, your tagline for the, the event, that's going to be the way that you you sell your event to publications, to prospective audience members. You want to make sure you have a very, very tight tagline. You want to make sure you have a budget and that it's very, it's, it's including all the unknown unknowns, right? And what I mean by that is things happen and sometimes you're tasked with um, you know, you have to book uh, another uh, talent that maybe costs more because someone else dropped out or maybe some equipment failed the night before your event. And so you have to purchase that. Just have a little nest egg, even with your budget, uh, you know, being similar to like maybe past events and you're thinking, OK, like maybe my budget will fall into the same parameters. You just want to make sure you always have uh, a little nest egg just in case emergencies arise. And you want to make sure that uh, you have, you're very deliberate in the kind of talent you book. I personally, I do not rely on talent to advertise my events. And the reason why I do that is because I produce a lot of comedy events with comedians and comedians are hilarious people, but they're incredibly, incredibly unreliable, right? So if you're marketing certain comedians and then they drop out the day or night of your show and people just came out to see that person, that can really, really hurt uh, your your you know return um, investment as well as hurt just the branding of your show. So you want to make sure that everything you do is about the show and the event versus the talent that's going to be there. Just because it's going to allow you to pivot accordingly in case that talent drops out and the audience won't be disappointed because you're still expecting to have a really, really good time. Uh, you want to make sure you keep organized uh, finances, including expenses talent and materials. I use QuickBooks for my production company to keep accountable with expenses. And I, you know, make sure that I'm very organized and labeling uh, what's, what's expenses, what's income. Does it come from my events? Does it come from Patreon? Because I want to be very deliberate how I allocate the additional funds in investing in future events and such. Um, you also want to make sure you test your personal equipment. You want to make sure that uh, you have um, you're familiar with if you're hosting a live event, uh, Zoom events, that you uh, utilize Zoom to the fullest, that you uh, are very, very comfortable with that functionality. I can't stress to you all how many events I've gone to that are online where it's clear the producer and the host don't really know how Zoom functionality works. They get uh, chat bombed often or they have uh, they have trouble controlling their audience. And so sometimes they'll be off mic and doing other things and that distracts from the talent. So it's really, really important for you to be familiar with the functionalities of the various video conferencing uh, sites you might be using, especially if you're looking to continue having virtual events uh, to appeal to a global audience. Okay, so uh, just kind of continuing talking about budgets, make sure you pay your talent for your events Fairly, but don't overpay or promise unrealistic numbers. And so what I mean by promise unrealistic numbers is 
I am currently um, in, in talks with producing several other events under Casa de Collins. And I've been very, very honest with the, the people that are booking me and saying, what is the number you can absolutely 100% guarantee you can get in regards to audience size? Because that is going to allow me to determine the right kind of venue, whether it's in person or online, that we should host your event. And it's, it's really important for as a producer for you to be very clear on what is realistic in regards to audience numbers. So you make sure that you budget accordingly, because if you over promise to pay talent a certain amount of money and you haven't met that threshold uh, before the show and you can't pay the talent, that's going to be a whole big issue. And you don't want to have that reputation as a producer. Uh, I will say only pay for marketing that you can't implement or organically or through your immediate network. I realized I tapped out all my resources, all my local resources um, I used before. I need to expand my reach. And that's why, like I mentioned, I invested in uh, Google, Facebook, Instagram ads, as well as um, asked my, my podcast and radio network, hey, what are some shows outside of New York that I should try to get on? To, to talk about Drum Black History or Medium Pop or other projects that I have uh, brewing for Casa de Collins. And then, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier with uh, following Jacob's question is, I use revenue to go back into the production company and that helped me improve production. I was able to invest in a mixer, uh, Rodecaster Pro, which is this whole setup here and allows me to do stuff like this. Not, not quite my tempo. I have a bunch of sound effects, which is always fun. Um, and that allows my events to be more engaging, right? So my talent that I book may not have this type of functionality, but myself as the, the producer and the host, I can do that. So uh, make sure that you, if you have the, the revenue, try to invest in your production company. I know everyone's got to eat and not everyone has a day job like I do. So, you know, you'll figure it out, but I would definitely uh, suggest that you invest back in your company to make sure that you're continuing to expand your reach. And then again, uh, seek sponsors as early as possible to help cover costs. Don't limit yourself. You, the worst thing that a company or a potential sponsor could say to you is no, right? But the other alternative could really help you in regards to your budget, in regards to the kind of talent you may be able to book or the type of features you might be able to include in your events. All right. The next one is give yourself some options. Allow yourself new opportunities that can help raise awareness about your brand and event. Kind of going back to what I talked about when Eventbrite reached out and said, hey, Brandon, we'd love for you to come and talk about Drunk Black History. I could have said, Ugh, I've never done an Instagram story chat before. I don't know. But I was like, absolutely. I'm going to take all the opportunities I have. And that kind of comes from uh, my grandfather, which goes into the next bullet point. Have a plan A, B, C, and maybe even Z for each event you put together. Now, my grandfather used to say, since I was a young kid, Brandon, give yourself options. And I interpret that in many ways. But for me, it always meant I have to have a backup plan to the backup plan, whether it's stuff with life, whether it's projects, always have a backup plan. And that's uh, something that I hold dear to this day, right? Um, so you want to make sure as you're scoping out plans uh, for your events that you have multiple ways that you can address uh, any kind of hiccups that might come. And know what you can and cannot live stream to avoid event disruptions. Ask other producers about their experiences. I have had a lot of friends that try to host Zoom events, but they also connected it with Facebook and YouTube, and they were taking all those platforms. But unfortunately, the people that paid to see their show had paid for the Zoom, the, the Facebook link or the YouTube link. And so they had to refund that money because there were certain things that they were showing that were in violation of the, their their copyright laws or what have you. And so you want to make sure that if you're trying to have any type of video, um, you know, event like you know, uh, parts of your presentation that it is sanctioned and that is original content, so it doesn't get flagged by those various outlets in case you're expanding onto those other different marketing tools for your events. And uh, this is more important for people that produce comedy events like myself. Have backups in mind in case of last minute emergencies with talent. I can't tell you how many times I've been really excited about having this one comedian on the show and then they text me an hour before their set time and they say, uh, I'm, I'm running behind my club spots. I'm not going to make it. And so I just had to think who's a local comedian who I know like is probably in the area or probably doing a show in the area. Text them and was able to get Nine times out of ten, I'm able to get a replacement relatively quickly. But that also comes from the reputation of my shows where people know that's going to be worth their time, and I'm also going to pay them. 
All right. We're going to just kind of knock out these because I want to make sure I have enough time for, for questions. Please put those in the Q&A uh, chat. So always be learning. Uh, this is just something me as a lifelong educator, I'm always learning. I'm always learning about Zoom functionalities to maybe to further enhance the experience of my audience. I have several Zoom books, uh, not just about teaching online, but about hosting things and making sure that you are fostering a safe, inclusive environment for your audience. I also did a lot of research on virtual events, how they were marketing themselves, how they were running, just to uh, you know assess what was going well, what was uh, needed to be omitted for the future events. And I also was reaching out to my network and getting feedback and insight from them as well to improve my virtual events as well as my marketing plans. And then I also did market research on various topics and themes for my events to determine the best way to uh, enhance global, uh, you know, global awareness, right? So I would like kind of ask people in different countries and be like, hey, like, how do you find out about events, whether they're like in person or online? And they'd be like, oh, go to this website. Or, you know, we really like look at a lot of stuff on Instagram that's focused on this this location. Like that information from the, the people I had in my direct network, whether it be on LinkedIn or Facebook, was incredibly insightful for me to be able to plan out my marketing strategies. And then as I mentioned, I read a lot of books about branding. Um, I read a lot of marketing books. Uh, I and I also just read about industries and and them uh, their ability or sometimes inability to to pivot uh, to change and embrace technology. And so I always want to make sure I learn from who I consider the best in their respective industries. And that's why I spend a lot of my free time reading books. And so uh, in regards to the future plans for Casa de Collins, I am uh, currently I have seven hybrid events planned starting uh, next month, uh, June uh, 2021 for our Juneteenth Drunk Black History Show, all the way to October, which will be our uh, follow-up horror theme uh, Drunk Black History Show. And at the venues that I booked, um, I made sure that they were high, they were allow for a hybrid um, experience. So we're going to have in-person seating, adhering to social distancing rules, and then we're also going to have live streaming options. And that's really helped me to maintain that global audience that I talked to you all about, while to continuing to increase the, the local footprint in New York City. And I'm hoping that in the future, when I go to different markets to host my various live events, that we'll be able to do the same thing. But for now, my in New York especially, I'm focusing on venues that will allow me to have both in-person and live streaming events. I'm really looking forward to seeing people in person again. The energy of our live shows, especially Drunk Black History, it's just something I've never experienced before. And I've been performing since I was in high school. Um, and so I, I, I can't wait for that energy again. But I also can't wait to see for our virtual audience to see kind of what we bring to the table when we're actually in person and we're, we're just in our element. But it, giving, giving your audience a global platform really, really allows for more engagement. It allows for more sense of community. I can't tell you the biggest thing that people love about our virtual events is the chat. It's the camaraderie that's going in there because they're all sharing this one experience. It's the same thing you would feel in a live uh, audience where you're like all laughing and enjoying whether it's a movie, uh, a play, or a comedy show together. And you can still have that in a virtual event. It's just really, really important that you as the producer and host that you set up that kind of environment so people feel comfortable being able to uh, express themselves and enjoy themselves like that. And then uh, demand will grow, but disposable income and budgets may decrease. So what I mean by that is, uh, I don't know if anyone in the chat is working with venues right now, but obviously they are hurting and, uh, you know, coming out of the, the pandemic. And so there's been an increase in ticket prices, but the split between the producer and the venue may not be as favorable as it was two, three years ago. So you have to also take that into consideration when you're figuring out your final budgets and how you want to um, go about producing your show. All right. And so, as I mentioned, my upcoming events, I got Drunk Black History for Juneteenth. If you're interested in joining us, whether it's in person or online, uh, you can get tickets at drunkblackhistory.com. I have a medium popcorn and Zoom movie night that will take place in July. You can follow everything medium popcorn and mediumpopcorn.com. My comedy outlier show is returning. Uh, we're not sure if it's going to be on a monthly basis, but it is returning at uh, the end of summer in August. At, uh, a local theater in the Lower East Side. And then I have a new show that's going to be, um, it's actually, I confirmed uh, the date for late August as well for that. I'm still working out the 
the structure of it, but it's going to be very much like kind of like a talk suit, but mostly about black uh, events and craziness. So um, if you're interested in following about that, check out my, my personal website, AmericanCollins.com. And then, um, you know, I would love to hear in the chat uh, before I answer some questions for the last five minutes. How have you tried to increase the global reach for your event? And while you're all putting that in the chat, uh, I'm going to be answering some questions from the Q&A. So Suzanne asks, how far into the future do you market your events? Have you already marketed the October 2021 events? What's your lead time? That's a great question. I usually allow for about two months lead time for the various publications that I have in my uh, my Rolodex. I give them a six-week heads up on events. Um, and I try to space it out, especially even if I have events that are within a few weeks of each other, just because uh, I want to make sure that the, the the marketing is both timely, but also relevant to what's going on. So I, I usually wait about two months, uh, you know, before I start, two months before an event, before I start, um, you know, sending out marketing materials and increasing my audience that, that way. Uh, Monique asks, where did you start to find people to do your virtual events? Um, I, I'm wondering if Monique is referring to talent. If you are referring to talent, essentially, uh, I, I use my comedy network and I reached out to people that were outside of New York that I knew might be interested in, whether it's joining me for a medium popcorn podcast or live events or for drunk black history. So um, I'm very fortunate to have a network of comedians, radio personalities, actors, actresses, uh, creative minds uh, since I came to New York in 2008. So that's where I was able to find the people for my virtual events. All right. Have uh, just three more minutes. I see some folks talking about um, using various events. Um, where can we purchase the Zoom book? Um, Michelle, if you find me on LinkedIn at Brandon Collins, I'll send you the direct link for the Zoom book. I don't have it handy on, on me right now. It's on my bookshelf over there, but um, I will definitely send that over to you. All right. Let me continue going through the Q&A. Uh, is it too, Rosetta is asking, is it too late to build a virtual event? I want to have recorded and live in October. Uh, so it's it's not too late to to build a virtual event. There's going to be a demand for this uh, for the next, I would say about two years at, at minimum right now, because not every, um, lo, you know, country and city is comfortable with opening fully. And so allowing uh, yourself to have that option for a virtual event is definitely going to be something that you can really invest in and hone uh, over the next few years. So don't be discouraged uh, because things are opening back up that there won't be an audience for virtual events. Great question. Uh, Elise is asking, would you recommend sticking with one platform, say Zoom, instead of using multiple platforms like Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, while presenting a single event? Um, at least that's a good question. If you are not sh like, you know, screen sharing, like whether it's a movie, uh, you know, maybe a, a YouTube video or uh, music, I would say you could probably stream onto the other platforms. You just have to be very, very mindful of what could potentially be taking off those platforms and because it's in violation of a copyright law or other, um, you know, policies that they may have in place. Great question. And I have time for one more. Uh, I see Ra asked, Hey, Brandon, I noticed that you don't have drunk black history listed on your LinkedIn page. It's because you're working for an employer and keep this project separate from your professional social media platform. That's a great question. So I actually, uh, the people that I work with, they know that I do comedy. I've actually had, um, the CEO of my company that I work at, he attended a drunk black history show, but I've been very deliberate at my company to be like, there's a uh, comedy, Brandon, and there's professional day, daytime Brandon. And so they've been very, very understanding of that. Uh, I know we're about to wrap up, um, but thank you for that question, Ra. And um, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. If you want to learn more about my events, please check them out on AmericanCollins.com or you can find me on LinkedIn at Brandon Collins. Uh, but it's been a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today.